<clears throat> okay, well, we can go ahead and get started this morning. Welcome, and thank you for joining the HLB International Transactions Webinar, Investor Opportunities, Navigating Africa's Deal Climate. In this month's session, our HLB panelists will cover an outlook of Africa's investment ecosystem, African trends in deal activity, mergers and acquisitions, and tax considerations for some of the key African jurisdictions. I'd like to introduce our panelists now. William Hanan from uh, is the co-founder and COO of Orbit. He's our guest speaker. Anant Patel is HLB Global Transaction Advisory Leader. Dave Springsteen, HLB Global Tax Leader. And Clense Apuvo. I said it wrong, Apuvu, <laughs> HLB Global Not-for-Profit Leader. And I'm Lisa Benson, HLB Chief Regional Officer for Western Markets. I'd like the audience to know um, that they can post questions in the chat box on their control panel. So you can do that throughout the webinar. And we'll also have time for a brief Q&A at the end. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, Will, I'd like to give you uh, just a, an opportunity to give us an overview of Orbit. Um, so I'll start off with uh, Will and our overview. That's great. Um, thank you very much, Lisa, for the kind introduction. Um, Good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Um, thanks very much for joining us. Um, it's great to be here and uh, with um, with HLB. Um, so just a brief introduction to Orbit uh, for those of you that um, are not familiar, not um, know much about us. So we are Africa's first um, business development and investment platform. We are a pure Africa-focused financial services platform that um, match makes both investors to investment opportunities, but also matches service providers um, to uh, corporates and investors and transactions that require services. So we have over 450 institutional investors that use our platform to originate uh, investment opportunities. And those are across um, all different asset classes from private equity to private debt and, and tr including trade finance as well. We typically work on transactions anywhere between three to 80 million US dollars. Um, and then that's for the for the deal origination. So both through our network of advisors across the continent, plus corporates come to us directly uh, to be matched to the most appropriate global uh, institutional investor. Through our visibility and access to all of those um, deals, both during the, the screening um, stage before we put them live, but then also during the various stages of the deal um, lifetime, then we see opportunities for where service providers are needed to either prepare an, an opportunity to, to bring it to market, so we're able to match it to investors, but then also where um, there's additional services needed once an investor is engaged to get that through to a successful close. And we'll be able to talk about a little bit more about that. Um, and then, so that's where the opportunities come from for us to make uh, referrals and help with business development for all service providers ac across the continent. So currently we have about $1.3 billion worth of deals live on our platform. And to date we've had um, circa $400 million worth of 
uh, term sheet issued um, on on deals, and we have over 400 advisors uh, that use Orbit currently for their business development and to to reach investors um, that have a all have a specific mandate uh, to invest into Africa. So it's just a, a brief overview, and we'll be able to tell you a little bit more about ourselves as we as we go through this webinar. Thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay, well, let's go ahead and jump right in. So, Will, where are you seeing the greatest investor demand at the moment? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. You know, Africa still remains, I think, one of the um, on a you know on a global scale um, as a, a really key jurisdiction for foreign direct investment, even from twenty. 17 through to 2018, there was an 11% growth in, in foreign direct investment, and that represented $46 billion worth. And uh, that was in a, in a recent report by the UN. Um, it doesn't tell the whole story, just those, those top level figures. You know, the, there was a high water period of in 2016 where it was nearly $60 billion. So, you know, there was a little bit of a, a cooling through to 17 but it seems to be much more positive and, and much higher inflows into into the whole continent um through through the last uh two years or so and expecting 2019 to to continue in that vein you know it's a it's a very large continent as we all know 54 different jurisdictions so it's not homogenous so there's certain sectors and geographic regions which we see a lot more invested demand than others so if you break it down on the on the sector side, then certainly agriculture would be probably the top um, sector. More importantly, the kind of secondary and tertiary, so agri-processing and agri-logistics. Mm -hmm. Primary agriculture growing is still quite specialist and, and probably less demand there. If you look across the other uh, sectors, then certainly uh, energy and mining, financial services, and kind of logistics, um, healthcare, education, and then growing uh, demand for, for fintechs as well. And then if you look at across uh, the continent and you look at more around the, the ge key ge geographies, then there's uh, deeper, more established markets that, that we all know very well, such as um, South Africa, Nigeria, Egypt. Uh, there's very strong demand um, in those. Uh, it's a key driver when investors, particularly equity investors, they want to see the depth of the, of the local market. They understand the challenges of going international. Um, so if there's a large local market that a firm can address, an investment opportunity can uh, work within, then, then that's a good driver for them. But then more broadly, there's some very strong growth uh, across the rest of the continent. There's some of the smart, smaller economies have still seen, you know, double digit growth over the last decade. So like sort of Ethiopia, Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, Botswana, Rwanda, Senegal. Um, but then, you know, there's, there's other markets which, which remain key as well, like sort of Kenya, Morocco and, and Mauritius, which uh, I'm sure my panelist uh, Clancy will be able to bring some light to as well. Well, this is, this is an ad. Just to ask you a question, you mentioned obviously a significant increase in investment into Africa and FDI. Are there particular regions outside of Africa, meaning uh, where are the investors originating from? Is it Europe? Is it, uh, is it North America? Do you see trends in terms of certain regions having more appetite to invest in Africa? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a really great question. Um, yeah, I think for ourselves, and we've got a, a pretty good you know, aggregated view of where all this investor demand is sourcing from. A lot of it is the capital is managed within the continent, um, and that's growing, which is which is great to see because you know um, there's strong maturing financial services and therefore market, and therefore investors are able to to run their operations from within the continent. I think outside of the continent, then still a lot comes from Europe and is channeled through the key. 
um, hubs are, of London kind of generally covers the, the uh, Anglophone and then a lot through Paris on the, on the Francophone um, countries and regions. And then uh, we are seeing increased interest and demand from the Middle East as well. I think that's certainly one area where we are putting a lot of time into uh, building relationships because um, there is an increased uh, appetite coming from from the capital within that region. Some from the Far East that tends to be much more on the trade side, so trade finance and um, angle. And then North America has it has its part to play, but you know, as we well know, North America is such a uh, such a huge market as themselves, and the the appetite to come across the Atlantic is is kind of more specialist so i would say it's more europe and, and middle east would be the key areas thank you and clancy what about you what uh what are you seeing yeah with... um i think mauritius uh, just a short introduction about myself first uh, i am the senior partner of the chair of when associates in mauritius and for those who know Mauritius, apart from tourism, we do a lot of international financial uh, services. We have, we have a, a, very, a, a very interesting IFC. Uh, and uh, we, we usually say that, you know, a lot of people now are using Mauritius as gateway for investment into Africa. I tend to agree with Will because there is a lot of investment coming from European countries. And uh, what we do in Mauritius is that uh, we do a lot of restructuring. And actually, we have got some more than 1,000 uh, funds, CIS uh, and uh, private equity, uh, which are using Mauritius as base because of tax reasons, of uh, you know security reasons, or different other reasons, right? Finance also, and investing into different parts of Africa. Now, uh, in terms of uh, Af the states in which uh, there is a focus for investment, actually, we find a lot of investment going into Mozambique, the eastern part of Africa. Uh, Kenya, Mozambique, uh, Tanzania, and uh, even South Africa. But also, there is more and more demands uh, now for investment into uh, the, Afri the French-speaking countries, Senegal, Cote d'Ivoire, and uh, other on the, on the Western part. But uh, uh, what we do in Mauritius is that we position Mauritius as a, as a country where there is, you know, there is no exchange control, there is low tax between 3% and 15%, uh, depending on the type of structure you use. Um, so there is a lot of investment coming in, and we will see in a few minutes, I think we've got a slide to show to you, uh, how much uh, investment is going, is flowing from Mauritius into, into Africa. Okay, great. Dave, Anand, anything else to add? Yeah, it's good to see from our investors and clients and prospective clients, they, they look at, at Africa as a new opportunity. Uh, some will say that China and India are maturing out and with the billion people in Africa and the need for infrastructure, uh, there's a lot of exciting opportunities. Uh, it's even great to see that uh, Africa is going green with one of the largest solar fields in the world. So there's lots of opportunities feeding off other opportunities. That's great. Good, 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 good. Okay. Um, Clancy, you, you spoke a little bit about Mauritius. Can you um, kind of give us an update on um, how Mauritius is a, an investment gateway to Africa? Yeah, I would say that uh, we set up in Mauritius our IFC, International Financial Center, around the late uh, 80s right, or early 90s. Uh, Mauritius is reputed to have been the biggest uh, outbound investor into India for more than two centuries. And uh, now there is some changes into India, which is looking more into inside setting up their own IFC. And that's why if it's since uh, more than one year now, we are having, uh, you know, we are looking into, we are looking uh, west, as we say, in Mauritius, because we are looking into Africa. And you will see in this chart that is in front of you, that there has been a very important growth in terms of uh, asset value uh, invested into CIS and CEF. CIS will stand for Collective Investment Scheme and CEF for Close uh, N uh, Funds, and which, uh, you know, uh, which represent a lot of funds going into Africa for, for investment. And actually, we have got more than 1,000 funds like this 
uh, and uh, there is a, a total management of more than 100 billion US dollars, uh, which is in management, right, uh, flowing into Africa essentially. And uh, so, because of uh, the position of Mauritius, uh, we are bilingual and we speak a third language. So we are able uh, from Mauritius, you know, to uh, to target uh, both uh, sides of Africa, uh, the French speaking as well as the English speaking. So just to say that Mauritius is really a, a, an important place and a strategic place, right, which is channeling investment into Africa. Absolutely. Um, and Will, what about you? Yeah, obviously, um, I think just building on uh, on what uh, Clancy was saying, um, we we do see a, a huge amount of flow through uh, Mauritius. Um, they really are um, developing themselves as the international financial centre for for the for the continent. Um, admittedly, you know, there's a little bit of challenge from a few others that are up and coming, but I think um, Mauritius of a of a good um, head start and, and a real depth of of um, skills and experience um, and as Clancy touched on the, the dual language capabilities are, are really important when you're looking at uh, true pan-African coverage um, and we're seeing um, and I'm not sure if anybody else or Clancy particularly is seeing this maybe more um, cross m a between both the francophone and anglophone it used to be very siloed um but we're seeing more uh, more of that um appearing across the continent which is very interesting and you know it, it help all helps for, for mauritius that's a great point and um anad or dave what about you with the uh investments going through mauritius yeah, from a U.S. perspective, clearly, uh, if you're trading into India or with India, often the investments are structured through Mauritius, and there was at one time some great tax incentives. But again, it's a, it's a good market to flow funds through. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Clancy, how, how many do you have tax treaties, uh, dual tax treaties with 36, 34 different countries from across the continent? Africa, yeah, we have got at least some um, uh, 36 uh, countries. And we also have what we call IPPAs, International Protection and Promotion Agreement, which protects investment uh, on a G2G basis, which is a very important security for investors going through Mauritius and into Africa. And we hold some 22 I IPPAs up to now. Yeah, yeah. And then also, actually, something else interesting, the, uh, when you're looking to potentially go public as well with any of the, um, these opportunities, then Mauritius Stock Exchange are very active and they're also looking at interesting things that they can do. So they're able to do um, dual listings with, um, with other international exchanges as well, so that it gives um, some US dollar exposure um, or uh, other currencies so there's uh, there's a number of different things going on across the uh, Mauritius that make it very interesting yeah you're right Will because it uh, yeah we've got a lot of uh, uh, dual listing being done with Johannesburg you know Mauritius and you know in Nigeria and uh, what's happening now that we are getting a lot of new uh, vehicles for investment uh, in terms of investment banking units investment dealers for asset management wealth management and then I talk about fun. But now we get a new payment intermediary, which is bringing in the new, you know, digital asset, a digital wallet, digital marketplace, in order to bring up, uh, you know, not only fiat currency, but also we've got markets now for cryptocurrencies and digital assets. Question for Clancy and or Will uh, within Africa: Are there certain regions or governments that are actually providing significant and lucrative incentives? Uh, to make investments in one country versus another, you, you're seeing a lot of governments kind of uh, really being friendly to foreign investors and, and providing either state, local or other benefits to uh, make acquisitions or, or 
have green fuel uh, sites. If I may answer, uh, on my side, from Mauritius' point of view, as I've said, um, apart from double taxation treaties, we hold a number, we've got some 22 IPPAs, which are the, the, the investment promotion and protection agreements between different countries. So this is a very important landmark because it, uh, it enables, uh, it gives some, a lot of security for investment going through. And also uh, what we have uh, from, we have got a lot of treaty, uh, African treaties. I would mention the SADC treaty. I would mention, you know, the COMESA treaty, which uh, groups a lot of uh, African countries in which Mauritius is a party. And this uh, brings in a lot of protection for investment. It's interesting. Yeah, and I think just building on top of that, you know, if you look across the, the rest of the continent, there's certainly um, some countries which are, are really drive, being driven from the top down um, to push themselves up the, you know, the ease of biz, doing business rankings. I think one that you kind of, the, the, one of the leading examples um, will probably be Rwanda. Um, you know, they're, they're pushing a, a huge amount of regulation so the, uh, the ease of being able to start business, um, ease of uh, um, foreign ownership, uh, land rights, uh, a lot of this kind of development that they, um, they're pushing very, very heavily and actually kind of um, leading the way well ahead in the terms of digitization than, than most Western um, jurisdictions as well. So, you know, using blockchain for land registry, things like that, which, which all filters through to just providing a lot of um, trust within the legal system um, and then allowing, you know, ease of doing business, which might not be quite the tangible incentives that you were maybe talking about, such as tax relief and things, but certainly um, just, you know, trust within the legal um, and business systems in the country have, have huge value. Okay, that's great. So let's take a look at, um, you know, we kind of talked about the countries and geographically. What about the asset classes? What are asset classes are outperforming others? Mm. Yeah, it's great. I'll just jump in with this one, and then it would be great if um, the rest of the panelists have, have some thoughts here as well. So anyway, you know, when, when we started Orbit a couple of years ago, we were uh, purely private equity focused, mainly because that, um, that was where we, our business, that we understood of where we came from was the PE background. Um, I think that that model remains, and there's, but it also has its challenges across the African continent. A lot of, um, you know, large family-owned businesses that don't necessarily want to take on equity partners, but they do still need capital to to grow their business. You know, the equity model still works well. It's as I. It's, it says here, you know, it's very much tried and tested. Um, and the, there is, continues to be large new funds being being raised specifically for the African continent. Some would say that, you know, there's a bit of a challenge with deployment and then exit on the private equity. So deployment, I mean, raising large funds necessitates being able to do large transactions. So for instance, if you raise a fund with a billion dollars, you're gonna to look to do circa 10 deals of $100 million each. There's not that depth within the market quite yet for being able to absorb 10, $100 million deals very, very quickly. And then when you get to look at seven or five years down the line when you're looking to exit, then you know there's a bit of a challenge there on, on what the exit model is. Is it going to be an IPO that would have been more of the Western model? Um, or is it going to be a trade sale, et cetera? So you know, there, there's a lot of capital available, a lot of capital still being being raised, but there's, uh, it, there's some challenges there as well. Um, where we are seeing, from our perspective, from within Orbit, where we're seeing that the greatest growth is, is around private credit and trade finance especially. So the private credit, you know, I think the, with the family ownership of businesses and then much shorter transaction cycle, 
then it's a, it's a really great fit for a lot of corporates right across the continent. They retain ownership and control of their business that you know they spent many years or, or even generations uh, building. Um, but they're able to get the growth capital that they need and something that we'll, we'll get into uh, later, I believe, is that you know when you're looking at transaction cycles and what I mean by that is really the time needed to raise capital, then it's much shorter than what is normal within within private equity. You know, we're talking a matter of, of a, a few months rather than six to nine months for a, for a PE deal. And then the last one, the where we're certainly where we're seeing the, the largest growth is trade finance. And it's not something that's, that's been particularly well developed across the continent. Trade finance has been really supplied by local banks up until now, but there's a, um, the local banks have a lot of capital restrictions. They have their limited uh, lending and capabilities, and then also their costs are generally quite high. So we're seeing a lot of international capital flowing into the continent, specifically to um, supply trade finance. Um, you know, Africa is a, a trading nation, uh, continent, I should say, apologies for that, um, uh, a trading continent, and it's, uh, it's over half of the, the GDP for the whole continent. So um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a key area where it can help uh, companies with, uh, with their cash cycles and allow them to grow, um, to grow their businesses. Yeah, the only thing I would add there, Will, is uh, maybe it's not considered an asset class, but uh, JV, it's not always about the dollar. It's also knowledge, meaning local knowledge, uh, customs, culture, uh, understanding the uh, market that's going to buy your goods or supply goods to you. And so often, uh, you know, private equity may go in as a JV, but often a local JV might add value and speed to penetrating the market there. So, and in addition to a JV, often from a tax standpoint, we look at tax equity. And Anat pointed out that, you know, there are international tax treaties uh, that can be in place, but there's also income or profit incentives. There are investment incentives and, and there's other uh, government uh, funding that can be had uh, if you're going into the right markets. So there's a lot to tick off here as you penetrate or looking to expanding into a new market. Yeah, absolutely, David. It's a really good point. Yeah, something to add, just, just typically how private equity works. Obviously, private equity typically would uh, um, invest, and there may be a, a minority investor initially for, for initial growth, or they may do what we call a buyout, which is a majority um, investment of the equity. And often, you'll see business owners roll anything from 10 to 20 percent of equity um, of future growth. But I think from a business perspective, and we'll talk about other aspects of companies being ready for their um, equity infusion, but it is a sea change for the typical entrepreneur who runs the business, controls the business, and now you have an equity partner now that has a significant seat or even a controlling seat in terms of direction of the company. So there are uh, that aspect to kind of deal with in terms of bringing in different forms of capital and finding the right equity partner as well. Well, you'll probably see that, right, where certain equity investors are not only providing that equity, but also providing the expertise in the industry to really fuel the future growth of that business. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, and that's kind of... Um... You know, there's there's always the other side. Yes, there's the, there's the dollars, but um, but the other side that you that that relationship side when you're bringing in an equity partner, it really is that marriage. So there's there's what else is is being brought to the table, whether it's um, some form of partnership. You know, we we've worked with a number of funds that are already invested in a local company that have great market penetration but are then looking for what we call bolt-on acquisitions so they're looking for other partners or acquisition opportunities within their region so that they can build that company from 
uh, being a, a local market player into um, into a regional player and then maybe on from there. So I think that's a really good point. Okay, good. Clancy, do you want to chime in with anything here? Hey, I, I agree with you what is being said, but one important thing that we have to bear in mind is that, you know, contrary to, for example, when people, I just remember when a lot of clients were investing in India uh, previously uh, using Mauritius, uh, India is one continent and is one country. And when you go in Africa, it is a continent with 54 countries. So which means that there is a lot of cultural issues, even in terms of business metrics, in terms of business, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, which have to be taken into account. Lately, what we are doing in Mauritius is that we are developing a sort of fintech hub in order to bring up, you know, uh, different forms of vehicles which are going to be used using uh, digital assets, digital, you know, marketplace, uh, digital wallets and so on. So which means that it is, uh, there is a lot of innovations also happening in terms of uh, investment vehicles and investment modes. And basically what uh, Will has said, uh, I agree fully, uh, private equity, private credit and trade finance remain right, you know, in the forefront. Thanks. Great point. Will, how about, how can businesses better prepare themselves to raise funding, whether it's equity debt or tried, trade finance? How, how can businesses prepare for that? Yeah, there's um, there's a lot of lot of work to, um, in in preparation for this. You know, I think um, I'm sure my my colleagues on the panel here will will jump in. Um, that there's you know there's a lot of value in bringing and getting advice early in the process. Um, you know, you the the company founders, company owners understand their businesses and they've you know, spent many years growing them. Um, they um, should seek out advice on, on going to market and looking at A, what types of capital they need, really assessing their own business through, through the lens of a potential investor rather than you know, just the operational focus that they've that they've had for years whilst they've been growing um, that's where good advisors coming on board and can can really help with that um, you know there's certain challenges in the um, in the going through that invest uh, fundraise process so you know there's there's a big information gap uh, that exists between a what a company founder, company owner would uh, or company management team knows about the investment industry, about what the market looks like, how attractive their to make their how to make their business attractive for from an external and investor point of view. Um, this is ensuring you know safe environment to then be able to to share information, etc. And I think we're we're bridging a little bit into you know, the reasons why we, we've developed Orbit. Um, but then there's also just then identifying um, the, the right investors and making those introductions and developing those conversations through till successfully raising capital. And I've got a few points to bring on that, but maybe if my the other guys in the panel um, have any thoughts, then I'm happy to, to let them jump in. Hey Dave, you had spoke about uh, uh, joint partners earlier. Maybe that could apply here. I think that uh, important also to look at uh, cultural issues, business cultural issues. What we usually do when investors approach us, they, the first thing they ask is, you know, to make a country scan and to know a bit about more how the economics, the people, and the business uh, uh, metrics work. And then comes the second question is about, you know, what is the best way to structure uh, in order for us to go into a foreign country and find the foreign partner and the thing. So these may seem to be basics, but I think they are very important. 
because different countries within Africa will have different business practices, different business, uh, you know, cultures. And so right from the beginning, it's important to get the right advisor to advise on business cultures, to advise on business, uh, you know, uh, fundamentals. And then, of course, use the proper structure to go, which caters for finance or for tax and all these things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and a recent deal that we just did, all the financing had to come from the U.S. It was easy to raise. Uh, some of the uh, lenders and investors had some African connections. But at the end of the day, the only way the home building uh, contracts worked in um, in Western Africa was to have boots on the ground, knowledge uh, that came from local uh, experienced uh, contractors. So it's very important to maybe mix this up on how you uh, expand into Africa. Yeah, I think that's great. And I think just, you know, building on that is, you know, the for even for the advisors that, um, that you know, companies do engage, then they still um, often need uh, some guidance on what specific investors, the expectations and standards of each investor. So, and that's kind of where um, where Orbit brings a lot of value is because we're engaged by uh, by the investors. You know, we have we speak to them regularly to understand what countries, what industries, um, what deal types that they are looking for. There, and also because we're engaged on multiple transactions with them at any time, we understand what their expectations are around investment material, their investment process and, and things like that. So the, the reason why a lot of the um, intermediaries, the either corporate finance advisors or accountants, auditors that are already engaged with them, with the companies and helping them to raise capital, then we're able to articulate that and share that knowledge back with them so that they're able to tailor their responses, tailor their um, investment material, et cetera, to, to the individual requirements of, of the investors. And we found that that just allows the, the deal process to, to move along a, a lot quicker and more likely to get engagement. You know, we help to give that view from the investor's side because you know, investors see hundreds of opportunities a year and, you know, but, you know, maybe a dozen a week and they have to screen these very, very quickly. So if we're not able to deliver concise information from the outset, then it's very high likelihood that it would just get a, an immediate rejection rather than um, spending any time to really dive into the into the details. And that's where, you know, presentation's key and the ability to present, the, you know, key selling points um, succinctly. Um, um, and then really where the Orbit team kind of really tries to help as much as possible is we stay right involved in the process. So, you know, we we come on introductory calls, we, we provide standardized Orbit teasers for introductions, all these type of key points that just helps um, address some of the frictions within within the deal process. Yeah, I'm I'm sure you have a lot of stories you could share. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think yeah, we have yeah, and indeed, you know, I think we've just tried to address what are the key friction points within the market, um, and just try and help everybody to do more business more efficiently you know such as ndas are a great example um i'm sure everybody here on the panel has uh has wasted many weeks going backwards and forwards with with ndas bouncing them between legal departments you know over mining tiny minute details and then waiting for a certain person to come back in the office to give a signature um it's just non not productive time so you know that's why we built the the nda process into into our platform to help just streamline that and then allow parties to exchange information through orbit and they're covered with with our agreement but then um then transfer uh documents and information securely through our platform so that um, people can get down to the real business of um, of doing the deal. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, what, what strategies can service providers employ to better prepare their clients? I mean, you, you just touched on a lot of those, um, and, and Clancy has touched on, um, cultural differences too. So how do we, how do we help, uh, our service providers employ better uh, to better prepare their clients for growth. Hmm. Yeah, maybe I can start, um, Lisa, on that. Uh, we actually have a practice which is part of our consulting practice called a value and growth planning practice. And to tag on to what Will was talking about, obviously the client and the entrepreneur are experts in their industry and far be it for us to suggest that we know more but really working with entrepreneurial clients we see a lot of uh, similarities in terms of how they run the business and we see um, a lot of businesses that uh, run differently and, and and how they really look at growth um, um, on a long-term perspective and we look at our clients in terms of whether you're selling now, whether you are looking to exit, always think about, and we'll mention it, always think about your company from a, a buyer's perspective, because buyers are always looking at value. So if you can look at your own company from a, a viewpoint, from a buyer, uh, then hopefully your strategies um, are really to enhance shareholder value. So how can we as service providers help in that process? I think fundamentally what we see is that many businesses, many business owners, um, you know, the concept of working in the business versus working on the business is so busy kind of dealing with day-to-day -day, um, activities versus really stepping back and saying, okay, where do I want to be in three years, five years, 10 years? Um, how do I want to transition? What markets do I want to be in? What sales channels do I need to expand? What's my customer profile looking like? What's my margin looking like? And so forth. And we come initially by looking at historical financial performance, but really building out a strategic plan that's centered from financial information. So we've, we get very granular. And we often see is that it opens up opportunities it opens up thought-provoking perspective in terms of how to grow a business not only from the top line but the bottom line and we see two things that often um, are either issues or things that companies need to enhance to enable the company to grow one is human capital often it becomes a viewpoint of do we have the right people in your senior position to grow the business? Do we have the right skills and expertise and so forth? Uh, so that's a key element. And secondly, do we have the financial balance sheet and so forth to grow? And often, you know, that is a process and this is obviously significant in terms of why companies look at uh, additional investment and so forth. So they're the fundamentals, I would say, in terms of, you know, starting to look at future, look more at long term, and have a discipline around a strategic plan and then obviously you know any strategic plan that could be well documented and so forth is really as good as the extent that it becomes part of the plan for uh, execution because you know you can write the plan and and, and if nobody's actually concentrating on that then you know um, you know it's 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 a waste of time that means that you know companies doesn't have to be so granular in terms of the strategic plan. You still have to have um, the foresight of different opportunities or different segments that may not be in the plan to to take and be nimble in, in terms of uh, growing the business. But they're the things that we spend a lot of time in really positioning the company for future positioning the company in terms of the growth and so forth and really facilitating that process beyond uh, preparing the initial strategic plan. Yeah, Lisa, from a tax perspective, we don't want to lose sight of that silent investor we always and everyone hates where the government could take anywhere from 10 to 30% <laughs> of the profits. 
So <laughs> knowing before you go, what are you entangling yourself into from a tax compliance standpoint? Uh, it was mentioned about uh, double tax treaties. We don't want to pay tax in two different countries. Uh, there's an incentive to structure or put a structure in place so you can reduce your worldwide taxation to a reasonable effective rate. You always want to look for tax incentives, as I mentioned. And where are the functions of the business going to be operated at? Home, host country, local country, or some third country. Mm -hmm. So know before you go what tax ramifications you're going to hit. And I also mentioned, what about the exit strategy and the taxes on exit? Very important. I, I like that you refer to the tax man as the silent partner. <laughs> well, he's not so silent. He's very uh, obnoxious <laughs> at times. <laughs> well, or Clancy, would you like to add anything? Uh, yeah. Yes, I'd like to just to I think uh, what uh, Anant has said is very uh, is very large, right, and very uh, sweeping, right, in terms of the approach, which is very good. And Dave's point also is uh, very pertinent in terms of you know not only to look at ongoing what is the tax uh, within uh, the operations, but when you exit, what are the issues which come in. I just like to just to to get to a word on governance. Right, you know, governance. Uh, there could be real gaps in governance in terms of expectations when you go in African states, right? There, because in some cases, you know, you are faced with a very uh, straightforward corruption, right? In uh, different. Uh, this is why I was laying a lot of emphasis on culture, right, which is there, which maybe practices in some countries, and uh, so uh, even uh, this is an issue that we have to take on board also, and this is why it is very important also. Uh, to know the, you know, to when when joining in, when coming in, to know what are the practices into that, because governance can really be an issue in some cases. Yeah, I would, you know, this is Willie. I just add that I would fully agree. You know, I think um, between um, the other guys, I think we've covered this really well. I think um, really getting the right advisors on board at the right time to really guide you through this is, is absolutely critical. You know, otherwise the, uh, the fundraiser, the corporate could end up spending a huge amount of energy um, and being very distracted from from their full-time real jobs of actually running the business. And and back to um, Anand or, or Dave's point, of they can end up um, kind of in a roundabout way, just um, being destructive uh, uh, for shareholder value, which you know is is the real driver here. Okay, great. Okay, so how can advisors generate more business across the continent to help companies get investor ready? Yeah, I think um, you know we we're all familiar enough with, with Africa and and know that it's a, a very high contact society and you know I don't think there's going to be any way to to remove that I think, but there's um, I think there are tools available that allow people to to build those relationships in a in a much more focused focused way and allow you know financial service institutions that could be uh, increased productivity and revenue without really increasing their their marginal costs too 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 quickly um, to allow them to you know acquire new clients and, and new mandates as they're going through. The you know couple of points that uh, that we really focus on helping to facilitate and that's um, networks, uh, market entry, and then differentiation. So. You know, for, for the networks, then existing advisors then often um, need recommendations for additional service providers in the, in either their local market or or, or regional or, or across the continent. So, you know, that that cross those networks between within the advisors then are, are really critical. I think we touched on this earlier that. Each transaction then will need a, a broad based team of different services in there, whether it's the whether it's the tax advice, whether it's the the legal um, 
whether it's the, the corporate finance and then the, the, all the structuring, um, you know, there's there's lots of elements that are required, um, and I think you know finding the right uh, people to, to bring together um, that have the right specialist and, and sector, um, either regional or geographic speciality or sector speciality, uh, can be can really bring a lot of a lot of benefits. Um, and then also when you're looking at, I think we've touched on this already about. Uh, market entry can be, you know, very time-consuming, costly, and, and often stressful. So, um, when corporates are looking to do market entry, then we, um, I think there was uh, Dave already brought up about um, looking for for local partners, but then also the the right local advisors that can that can get you set up, get you correctly protected, so that you can operate your business. Um, with the minimum amount of risk is, is really important. And then just the last one, I'm sure my colleagues will jump in here, then uh, it's uh, really about that differentiation as well um, for the advisors. Um, maybe being, whether that's previous being specialization around uh, raising a particular type of capital, whether it's been uh, you know, private equity or, or trade or, or debt, and really being able to Maybe work uh, closely with with local and, and international banks. Um, so you know, one way that we try and help is really allowing or educating local advisors on what the opportunities are on the international market and and how uh, other forms of transactions work, so that they're better able to advise their clients. Uh, and we help to to bridge them to the right investors. Yeah, I think it's important in this convoluted, very changing environment that we're in, that you uh, employ uh, employ a team uh, of advisors. And I guess the key is one, uh, know Will's contact information, very important. Two, know the HLB African network for the local expertise and uh, funding opportunities. And then uh, go from there. Uh, and it is a mixture of local and international experts. Because at the end of the day, you may be investing in Africa, but those funds will eventually come home. And so you need to know all the international ramifications. Great points. If I can just add a, a point is that, uh, you know, I think that uh, we'll say about that, it is okay, about specialization. Uh, from an advisor point of view, we cannot expect to be able to give all the services. We have to get some sort of a specialization and also important to look after business sectors. We cannot advise in every sector. And of course, we are also to be a bit, a bit country specific because there are 54 countries. We cannot spread all around just to this. And this is where what Dave is saying is important to use the network because we get HLB firms all around and this is how we can build up strategy and move forward. Perfect. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next question here. Okay, um, seeking additional capital or investment, what do companies need to consider to ensure that they're ready for a capital investment or M&A transaction? Yeah, there are a couple of things I would start off by saying is that, um, you know, two critical things that we, th think about from a financial perspective is credibility and visibility. So credibility of the business, the revenues and so forth um, is really underpinned by credibility of financial information. So historical financial information, whether it's the profit and loss account, the balance sheet and so forth, uh, depending on the size of investment and so forth, buyers or the investors do their diligence and they do a very deep diligence on the financial information. So having your books and records uh, be prepared within your standards of GAAP or your local kind of regulations and so forth is very critical. And often that's a just a benchmark and a foundation, quite frankly, that uh, investors look at in making sure that your financial statements are in accordance with uh, your local gap and so forth. That's kind of the credibility aspect that buyers are looking at. The visibility 
goes beyond the financial statements. Uh, the visibility, again, you have to look at your company in the viewpoint of what buyers look at and buyers diligence will look at beyond you've got an audited financial statement. They will look at granular in terms of revenue. They'll look at revenue by customer. They'll look at revenue by product. They'll look at revenue by different channels. They'll look at margins and so forth. They want to kind of slice open your financial statements and really look at the profit loss account and making sure they understand historically the trends of revenue, the profitability of revenue, and obviously the trends in profitability in terms of net income and so forth as well. So having good internal accounting systems and processes to capture um, uh, information, capture uh, real time, um, and capture and tell a story about the business is, is obviously very critical as well. So, so that's the visibility and credibility aspects of really preparing the companies from a financial system perspective. Investors, um, interestingly, and obviously um, is a pull and a push between buyer and seller, but investors are uh, looking to make sure that they fully understand the history understand the historical financials, but to increase shareholder value, the other aspect that you need to prepare is to look and have a good financial projection and forecast and so forth. Because from a seller's perspective, you want the buyer to be really incentivized and uh, excited about not only what you've done in the past, but what you believe you're going to do in the future. So having credible forecasts, having a, um, a, a bit of a stretch forecast that, that really uh, provides excitement to an investor. But the critical thing is during an investment cycle, during a, uh, a, a an investor uh, coming in, the owners and the and the business um, management really need to hit their numbers because often what we see is the distraction of bringing investment that may actually keep the eye off the ball in terms of running the business. And the the last conversation you want to have is that you've missed your numbers in a situation where you're bringing in investors. So that's obviously critical as well. Agreed. Will or Dave, would you like to add anything here? Yeah, from a tax standpoint, uh, visibility is important, but uh, global compliance is critical also. Uh, so we want to avoid uh, any GST, VAT, sales and use tax exposure. We want to make sure that uh, the appropriate income tax is paid to the right countries. So this will also impact the due diligence we'll talk about in a moment. No, I think not, uh, not too much to add from my side. I think the, the guys have covered it really well. Okay, great. All right. We are going to move on. Seeking investment opportunities. What do companies need to consider to ensure they're ready for a capital investment or M&A transaction? Did we just cover all of that? Yeah, I think we did cover um, think, yeah. all of that. And, and just to kind of underpoint, um, what I just said before, having the right investors around the transaction yeah. Um, yeah. and having the financials and so forth ready. And, you know, one aspect we didn't talk about is the legal aspect of the company, making sure that you have full documentation of all your businesses, your trademarks and all the different regions that you work on is, is another part of getting ready for, for a transaction. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know what? We have about a minute left. Um, Will, would you like to just make any final closing comments or points on anything that we haven't covered? Um, no, I think we we seem to have managed the the time pretty well. I think we've uh, we've managed to cover all of the points. I think it's, um, you know. Thanks very much for, for allowing Orbit to, to come and join the HLB uh, team for this. And um, you know, we, we welcome any follow-up questions um, if there if there is any. And um, we we really appreciate this opportunity to partner with you guys for this. Well, thank you for joining us. Does anyone else have any closing comments they'd like to add? 
Uh, just to just uh, just I want to add that uh, Mauritius uh, is a very important uh, gateway into Africa. So don't hesitate if anybody among the members or anyone needs information about Mauritius, about investing or de uh, making deals, right? Uh, from a from a, a perspective of getting into Africa, we are here. Thank you. Perfect. And that brings us to right to the top of the hour and uh, the close of our webinar. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you all for being panelists. Uh, the webinar has been recorded and will be on the hlb.global website if, uh, if you'd like to share it with anyone or if you need to listen again. Thank you all thank and you. have uh, a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye, okay. everyone. Bye. Wow.